what he said, I hope it wasn't anything bad. <laughs> I also need to tell you something else. Um, I have a audio transmitter uh, fixed exactly under my tailbone. <laughs> there. But I can assure you that what you are hearing is from my head and from nowhere else. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to take this opportunity to, uh, to give you a report. You know, I was thinking of what should I do? Should I tell the whole story or should I tell, uh, should I tell them about um, you know, what's happening? I said, no, I'll, I'll tell them where I am right now and uh, what are the good things that are happening and what are the really bad things that are happening. So, <laughs> so I know it's the last lecture of the whole lot, so I should have told you only the good things. But I think we really need to know what the whole story is with the dead prize and where it is right now. So, um, uh, you know about the TED prize. Um, in 2013, I was given the TED prize, which is quite a lot of money. It's a, a, a million dollars. Um, uh, so, you know, I called up my bank and I said, you know, be ready. <laughs> a million dollars. Uh, but Ted told me, uh, forget about that, uh, that's not how it works. The money goes to your university and you tell, you give us a plan of how you're going to spend it. Um, so I did that. Um, but I spent the money, almost all of it. I'll tell you where it, where it all went. So there's an experiment I did about 16 years ago, uh, which showed, um, but actually, you know, this line, I'm, I'm waiting for a few more years. I want to be able to say, there's an experiment I did before you were born, but, <laughs> but, but that will take a few more years. This was done 16 years ago. The idea was to show that children don't need to be taught how to use a computer, that they can figure it out by themselves. Um, everybody knows that now. But in those days, you know, there used to be classes. There may be one or two people here who remember that. There used to be classes where a teacher used to say, this is called a monitor. This is called a mouse. It has two buttons on it. The button on the left is called the left button. <laughs> and, and, so, and so on. <laughs> so, uh, I did an experiment to show that street children all over India would learn to use the computers and the internet by themselves and mercifully those classes stopped all over the world. <laughs> so, but then those computers were there all over India, Cambodia, South Africa and so on. Um, I had enough money to keep it running for another couple of years. So I kept them running and just to see what would happen. And uh, after about four or five months, uh, uh, we found that the children, well, actually after about nine months, we found that all the children in all of these places had reached the same level of computer literacy as an average office secretary in the West. So now that raised a whole lot of other questions. Say then, you know, what's the nature of training? What does training mean actually? I decided to investigate that further and for several years continued to find out what else can children do with a computer once they've learned how to use it. The way you do it is very simple. You take a computer, you take lots of children, you ask them a question, you ask them usually some sort of a, a kind of a interesting question, you know the kind of question that would really interest a, a, a 10 year old. Um, let me think of an example. Where's the end of the day? A good question would be, um, uh, why is there hair in the armpit? Uh, so, you know, that's the kind of question that children <laughs> like to engage with. <laughs> so, uh, but the answer is not very simple, by the way. The answer is very complicated. <laughs> and what I found was that groups of children left alone with a computer are capable of answering almost anything. Why? Because the, the internet doesn't know that they are children, so the internet throws everything at them. 
the children don't know what they are supposed to read and what they are not supposed to read. So they start quoting from, you know, the Harvard Business Review or something like that. It breaks all the rules and it didn't seem to have an end. I'm still looking for where is the limit. I still haven't found one. Um, so that was what the hole in the wall did. I also found that in this process, you need to have certain conditions. The computers must be in a safe place. Uh, the screens must be really big so that anybody passing by can see what's on the screen. It's very important that there's no adult around. Okay? If a grown-up person is around, particularly if there's a teacher around, all activity stops. You know, they get frozen in time. And if you go up to a group of children, I've seen this actually happen, and you know, a teacher going up to a group of children like that and in a very kindly voice saying, little children, what are you doing? And the children sort of freeze up and say, nothing. <laughs> okay. So you have to remove all adult intervention and then all sorts of things start happening. But you can accelerate this learning further by a simple method. I called it the method of the grandmother. You know, if we all had grannies. You know, grannies use methods which are very different from either parents or teachers. The granny method is to, to, to be around there, around the children, and say to them, my God, I can't understand anything. How did you do that? When I was your age, I was so stupid that I could have never come anywhere near a computer. Or something like that. They love it, okay? Then to show off to the granny, they go even further. All this is published, there's data on it and so on. So we called, uh, so uh, in 19, uh, in 2009, I put out an appeal in the Guardian newspaper saying, if you are a British grandmother, if you have a, a broadband and a web camera, then can you give me one hour of your time every week for free? And in two weeks, I got 200. I know more British grandmothers than anyone in this room. <laughs> and what we do, they're called the granny cloud. And what we do is we can beam the granny cloud anywhere using Skype. Um, I can beam them to places where they would not go or don't want to go or uh, where the children need them, etc. So then, when I won the TED Prize and I had to make a project, <coughs> um, I decided that I would approach it uh, by putting the, the two results together. What did the hole in the wall tell us? The hole in the wall told us that children can self-organize their learning. We call this a self-organized learning environment, S-O-L-E, which um, over here in Spanish you would say sole. And uh, it's happening actually, South America is a, to my great delight, one of the, uh, one of the most uh, uh, one of those places on the planet where most of these souls are actually being conducted today. So, you, you follow those conditions. Big screens, safe screens, lots of children, uh, uh, four or five children to every computer, absence of adults, a big question, a granny. So, for the TRED project, I proposed that we create seven experimental facilities called schools in the cloud. Each school, uh, where would I build them? Uh, I would build them from the remotest places on the planet to the urban, middle class, developed world. Five would be in India, two would be in England. And over a period of three years, I would try to see where do these schools take the children. Uh, What's the school in the cloud? Well, the easiest way to understand it is, the, is that a school in the cloud is like, an, like a vehicle, like an automobile, where the passengers are the drivers. I mean, that's the difference between a car of today and a horse and cart of yesterday. Horse and cart of yesterday had a driver. The car of today is driven by the passenger. So, if I let the children drive the school in the cloud, where will they go? This, this is the experiment. It will finish um, in November 2016. 
Um, I started out by looking for places and talking to children. Uh, Ted actually commissioned a documentary, which is to be released, I think, uh, early uh, uh, sometime this year. Uh, uh, here's a trailer. What is the future of learning? Could it be that we are heading towards, or maybe in, a future when knowing well, that's me is and that's obsolete? Okay. Hello. Could it be that we don't need to go to school at all? Well, the in the Could it be that at the point in time when you need to know something, you can find out in two minutes? My wish is to build a facility where children go on these intellectual adventures, driven by the big questions which their mediators put in. It's a facility which is practically unmanned. It will be called a school in the cloud. Good teachers don't go to remote places. The remoter you get, the worse primary education becomes. I don't know how to build a school in the cloud because I've never built one. So I'm trying to figure out a design which really speaking belongs to children and is run by children. So that's what's going on. It's a great big experiment. Schools as we know them now, they're outdated. As soon as I started doing it and seeing the buzz and the enjoyment of the kids, it made me look at my lessons differently and the role of a teacher differently, less talking at the front and more handing it over to the children. I really like it because it's independent and you to work with your friends. Gorakati may or may not be different from the schools of England, but that's what we are going to look for. The idea is to have a complete glass front to a building here and a large screen for a full-size Skype-in mediator. In Tamil, we have a London computer in London. All I ever really wanted to know about computers was how to turn them off. Hi! Hello, Rabin. Hello, Ajay. Hi. How nice to see you. Yeah, yeah. Look what I made. Can you see what this is? <laughs> You help a child to the point where if he wants to know something, he knows where to look for it and how to look for it. The more affluent children have people who will help them to learn anyway. But it's children in desolate areas who really desperately need to know how to learn. And I know that the internet does that. Learning itself is actually an emergent phenomenon, it's like a hive or like a thunderstorm. It's not about making learning happen, it's about letting it happen. Well, um, that was uh, last year. And I built them, uh, all seven. So uh, what I do is I just quickly go over each one just to give you an idea of the look and feel of the place and what has been happening since then, uh, just little stories which might give you a flavor of, uh, of the experiment itself. This is Killingworth, it's a, a little town uh, in northeastern England, very close to the home of George Stephenson, the man who made the first uh, steam engine, workable steam engine. Um, it has an Xbox in it and when I put it uh, there, the teacher said, Sugata, uh, you know, we, we kind of like you but you're going a bit too far. <laughs> Because <laughs> they're not going to do anything in that room except play with that Xbox. And I said, well, that's not their problem. That's our problem. If you were going to teach them history or art, and instead they're playing on the Xbox, it means history and art are more boring than the Xbox. So um, whose problem is that? Um, we started to play with big questions. And I have a, a, a picture which I'm very proud to show actually. You see that room? What's interesting about it is look at who is on the Xbox and look at who is not. There they are in the corner with their backs to the Xbox. If you give them the right challenge, they don't care about the Xbox. 
there they are. So in Killingworth, the teachers saw that and they realized that there is a way to get into a classroom with an Xbox and then make the children listen to you instead of the Xbox. It's hard, but then who said the teacher's job is easy? <laughs> this is Kalkaji, New Delhi, with a granny on the wall. She started off in the school for girls. These are little girls who are daughters of, um, you know, maid servants and, and that sort of thing. They're, they're quite poor, really. And they couldn't speak any English when they started off. I was speaking to her on the third day of the experiment. And I said, how's it going? So she said, oh, it's lovely. Those girls are lovely. They asked me, when are you coming next? So I said, in what language? And she said, English, three days. I went to the girls and I said, how did you do that on the third day? And the girls said, well, that lady, that really nice lady, she doesn't understand any other language. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little hamlet in England called Newton Eyecliffe with its uh, granny on the wall. One of the things I do when we do souls is that we tell the children that I'm going to go out of the room. I can't talk to you. You can't talk to me. So uh, we did a soul there with six-year-olds, really tiny. And we gave them a little question to do, some, something interesting. And they said, you can't talk to me, I can't talk to you. We went outside, waited for a while. After a while, I found a little child come up to the glass wall of the soul room with a piece of paper. And in that, in very poor spelling, was written, help, we are stuck. <laughs> He had beaten the system. I didn't tell him you can't communicate. I said you can't talk. <laughs> okay. uh, more pictures of Newton Eichliff. It, it looks like a lawn, like a park with benches and so on. This is Chandrakona in rural Bengal in India. And uh, in there, in there is a similar facility. If you can see on the screen, the far in the background, there's not a grandmother, but there's an Australian grandfather. He has a big beard, like that. The children made him take a meter rule and measure his beard <laughs> and report to them how long it is. The only unfortunate thing is it's doing some very strange things to their English accent, this Australian. <laughs> this is the hardest of the lot. It's called Korakati. It's on the Ganges Delta. That's what you saw in that film. You need to, to take three kinds of vehicles to get to that village. Um, you, you saw me talking in front of the, that jungle saying, this is where uh, we'll have a glass uh, front and so on. Well, there it is. That's the same spot there. Um, it's solar powered, air conditioned, with a tower which picks up the internet from about 25 miles away, 8 megabit per second internet. Um, so I did all of that and there it is. Um, except that it was a really hot day, 35 degrees centigrade. 80 degrees, 80% uh, humidity and uh, I turned my air conditioner on proudly. It was the only air conditioner within 500 square miles and I'm just sitting over there, outside of course, while they do their work. After a while, two little girls came out, tiny girls, you know, two little girls came out into the warm, fetid air outside and said, oof, so nice and warm. <laughs> so much for my solar air conditioning. <laughs> You know, their bodies are adapted to the, their own environments. Um, this is the latest of the lot. It's in Gocharan in Bengal. It's sort of semi-urban area. And uh, it's also the biggest of the facilities. It's a hexagonal structure. Uh, uh, it accommodates in a day more than 270 uh, children. So we are collecting the data while all of this thing is going on. Uh, the stories keep coming every day and I think in the end, in 2016, if you call me back here, I'll of course report the data but I think the stories will tell us more. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>